What's going on, everybody? And welcome to another special edition of the Bombastic Podcast. And uh, I had a little bit of a somber tone as Arkansas Razorbacks, their, uh, their season ended yesterday in the NCAA tournament in the Fayetteville Regional, which is over now. Kansas State has advanced to the Super Regional, so congrats to the Wildcats, uh, who I talked a lot of noise about uh, going into the Regional. And, uh, you know, credit to them for shutting me up. Credit to Simo for uh, having a nice little competitive weekend there. Head coach Andy Sawyer done a really good job there. Um, but also, this is about the Razorbacks. Let's let's make no mistake about it. This is an, uh, a shortcoming for Arkansas and one that we are going to get into and we are going to try and cover every aspect of and we are going to answer all your questions. And, you know, this offseason, there's going to be plenty of them. Uh, coaching changes, potentially roster changes, just overall direction of the program. Uh, there's more than ever for us to talk about. So uh, I do want to start by saying that one, thank you for everyone who has supported the bombastic podcast, tapped in and listened. I don't know if you've just started listening during the postseason or if you've been listening all year, regardless, or if you've, you know, maybe just tuned into an episode here or there, whatever the case may be. I appreciate everyone, each and every one of you who has uh, tuned in and made the show what it is. I mean, there's been a lot of shows where I've uh, really relied on the chat and we've mixed it up and, I really, you know, I always joke about how the Twitter AI machine referred to it as a digital dugout. This program is a digital dugout for Arkansas Razorback fans to speak. But uh, frankly, I, I do feel like obviously I just host the show by myself, but I like to have, you know, people on to help me. Daniel, she, Curtis, John, whoever, players. And we're going to continue to have more and more players and prominent figures, uh, you know, tell their stories on this podcast. I look forward to doing a lot of that. Uh, reach. Went ahead and reached out to uh, some of my some of my most notable alums and was kind of planting the seed already of like, hey, might want to might want to chat again this summer. But uh, I did also want to start by one thanking you, but also just reminding you that we ain't going nowhere, man. Like the Bombastic Podcast, I've had two people tweet at me today. And they were like, man, I'm gonna miss the Bombastic Podcast, and it's like, dude, I I'm recording an episode today. Uh, we ain't going nowhere. Uh, this baseball program ain't going nowhere. And look, we can. We'll get into the the weeds of whether or not y'all believe that's true. If you think this program's cooked, if you think whatever, um, but in terms of me and this program, this this program, the Bombastic Podcast, uh, we are going to continue to cook. We're going to continue to have episodes at least one a week throughout the off season. I mean, there's so much to talk about when it comes to them building this roster. Where does the program grow from here? Like I was saying earlier, uh, and we are going to plan to answer all those questions. And I also do want to make a concerted effort to keep track. I always do it every year. Uh, you know, if, if anyone's been following me for the, the last few years, you know that I like to keep up with the summer ball of what's going on, whether that's Cape Cod, whether that's the California league, Northwoods league, uh, there's always promising notable developments that are happening there. And just, you know, that's when you kind of figure out what's going on with the development of some of these guys. And so, uh, I will be sure to keep you guys up to date on all that stuff. Obviously any transfer exits, transfer commits, uh, any you know MLB draft talk that'll start really heating up there in the month of July, and so I really look forward to doing a lot of that. And I did just want to make that as clear as I could at the top of this program that uh, we are not going anywhere. We are going to continue year round, even into the fall when these guys get on campus and start playing. We will be cranking with the bombastic podcast. Obviously, not as many people are going to be tapped in. People really want the the postseason. I mean, we do this all year round. You're looking forward to the postseason and. And now if the postseason is over, I know a lot of people are going to just be like, all right, well, screw this team, screw this program. I'll, uh, you know, we'll talk next year or whatever, which, you know, if that's the way you want to do it, that's perfectly fine. I don't, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, but part of what I think has made this season, for me at least, so special is doing this show and continuing to cover every aspect of this baseball program, which is a program that, frankly, I love. Uh, it's a program I would not be here today. And when I say here, I mean, not my guest room, but I would not be here on this platform uh, with Natty State Sports, I would have never gotten into journalism. I would have never gotten into media coverage. I would have never gotten into any of it uh, if it weren't for this baseball team because it's provided me with some of the most special moments of my life as a fan, as a just observer of sports, uh, as a professional. Also, of course, I mean, going to 2022, that Op Omaha run was really one of the, the turning points in my career where I realized I was like, I never want to do anything other than this. You know, I always want to be doing this. Uh, obviously we all kind of hope that we'd, we'd have another Omaha run this year. We'd get to, you know, live a part of that special moment. And that sucks that it didn't happen. But, uh, I do just want to continue to make it clear that that's not, you know, it's not going to affect the scheduling of this program, affect what we do big picture. And, you know, honestly, I'm a big believer in life, just big picture that however much you put into something, 
is how much you get back for the most part. I mean, obviously, it's not always A to A, B to B type of thing, one to one. Uh, but I'm a big believer that, like, say Arkansas were to win the national title in baseball or basketball or whatever, uh, everyone would be able to enjoy it. The entire state would obviously be able to enjoy that and and, and identify with that and be like, oh, yeah, that was awesome. Uh, but it would be a lot different if you were kind of on the journey the whole way. And uh, frankly, that's kind of what we hope to – that's why we do what we do is we want to ha- give you all that experience. We want to be a part of that experience with you. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know what the future holds for Arkansas baseball. That's kind of what this – uh, this podcast, at least today, is about and what this offseason, we're going to answer a lot of those questions and figure out what the next steps are for this program and where it turns. But I do just want to uh, assert myself as clearly as possible as your go-to source for all of that stuff. I'm going to be here helping you process it through it all, uh, maybe just giving you someone to yell at here and there. That, I'm, I'm perfectly fine to pay, play that role as well. Uh, but I did just want to remind you guys, we're not, uh, we're not going anywhere. And so, man, I really look forward to uh, what's going to be, I'm sure, uh, you know, a hectic, chaotic, maybe stressful at times off season, uh, and it'll lead into yet another uh, high stress season, which, again, don't always end the way we want them to, and it really sucks, man. That was, I mean, yesterday, I don't need to tell you guys that was a tough pill to swallow, um, but I do want to remind you guys also, L Jennings Law, <laughs> don't wait too long to make a plan for your future. That's kind of the basis of what L Jennings Law wants to do. Maybe the Arkansas Razorbacks uh, should have trusted them. They are specialists in trust, uh, business succession plans, just long-term planning for your business, elder law. Uh, don't wait to get yourself covered. Uh, you see the number below, 501-501-WILL. That's 501-501-9455. Uh, and you can check out their website, www.lgenningslaw.com. They are a good steward firm and you can count on those guys, and we appreciate all they do for Natty State Sports uh, and for the Bombastic Podcast. And uh, also, guys, I do want to give a quick shout-out to our, our old friends over at Alumni Hall uh, who have been loyal with us forever. Uh, that's, I mean, for my money, this the go-to. This should be your go-to source for any Arkansas apparel, any Arkansas whatever. Uh, whatever lucky hat you were wearing this season, hoping it was going to carry Arkansas through, it didn't work. You got to go get a new one. Uh, maybe you can go get the yellow hat. Maybe you can go get their their black, the charcoal hat. I was looking at that the other day at Alumni Hall. Uh, you could also get, for clearance, you can get a Jackson Wiggins jersey. Uh, I saw those on display. You can get some Rocket Sanders gear. You can get all kinds of stuff. But uh, Alumni Hall seriously is the go-to source. I mean, T-shirts, sweatshirts, sweatpants, kids for the clothes, kids for the baby. Uh, they 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 are the cream of the crop when it comes to Arkansas apparel. And uh, you can, I mean, you should be you should be a fan of Alumni Hall, but you could also help us out and help them out. Uh, shop online today, nattystatesports.com slash alumni hall. That link, uh, that address will take you right to their online website where, you know, you can see for yourself the stuff you want to see, the stuff you like, don't like. You can kind of sift through from there. Uh, or you can go check them out in their on per, in-person location in Fayetteville uh, over on College right by the Whole Foods uh, where Curtis Wilkerson shops. Um, so, yeah, check those, those, got those guys out today, nattystatesports.com slash alumni hall we appreciate them for all they do for the bombastic podcast and for natty state sports do also want to just you know programming reminders of course uh be sure you're subscribed to this channel which you know if you're watching it on you know youtube is the bombastic podcast on youtube which has its own separate feed i know that i sound like a broken record i say this crap all the time uh but frankly i just you know i was a little i was a little disappointed this postseason that the bulk of our viewership was coming from the main Natty State Sports channel, which is fine. I mean, obviously, I work for Natty State Sports. We want that channel to be popping as well. Uh, but I feel like there are just so many people who consume this product that are subscribed to the Natty State Sports channel that are not subscribed to this one. Uh, maybe you're listening to this day and you're like, man, I've been kind of wondering where I could get it. Uh, so I do have to throw out those reminders just to let you guys know. Make sure you're subscribed to this podcast. Uh, and if you're listening on Apple, Spotify, whatever, get with us on YouTube and vice versa. If you're watching on YouTube and you're like, Hey, I'm tired of looking at this guy's face. I just want to listen to him. Uh, well, you can do that. Spotify, Apple music, uh, Amazon music, Stitcher, like whatever. I don't think Stitcher's a thing anymore. Uh, but wherever you get your podcast, we are on there. So make sure you subscribe there. The bombast, uh, the bombastic podcast, and, uh, we will not let you down. Um, so guys, like I said, there is a lot to get into with this Arkansas baseball team. I didn't know exactly how I wanted to go about this podcast from just a scheduling, like how, how I wanted to say it. I mean, I, I frankly, if I can, 
you know, level with you guys for a second. Even 24 hours ago, I had uh, no intentions of recording a season ending podcast. I mean, you guys are not surprised to hear this. I mean, you, you know, I'm a pretty optimistic glass half full kind of guy. I had a lot of confidence in this team that we just watched at Arkansas. I thought they were going to uh, go on a run. I picked them to win the freaking national title last week. Uh, I thought they had the pieces to do it, man. I thought it particularly on the pitching side, you get to Omaha, this team would have a chance. Uh, but I say all this to say, I was not prepared for how, what was I going to say if Arkansas went one and two in the Fayetteville regional. And, uh, I was having to record a podcast on Monday, kind of eulogizing the season. Uh, and so I, you know, I, I, I mean, it's going to take me a little minute to process this. I mean, I've been thinking about it a lot, just kind of looking at different things and trying to make sense of what I can just say is a very, very, very disappointing finish for the Arkansas Razorbacks. Uh, no two ways around it. And frankly, like, I would love for there to be like some sort of like reason for it. I mean, I feel like that's kind of as fans, as observers, as like just people, that's what we always do. Something happens to us and we try to think, why did that happen? You know, oh, a guy, uh, guy came out and hit my car. What happened? Oh, he ran a stop sign. Like, okay, you kind of make sense of it. That's what we're always looking for in life. And so when our sports teams lose, we're like, why did that happen? And, uh, I would love for, you know, everyone thinks they know the answer to that question of why did Arkansas lose in the NCAA tournament? And if you ask your buddy, he might tell you it's because of that freaking Nate Thompson. It's because that hitting coach, man. He told him, he told him to hit nukes and only try and hit nukes and don't worry about getting on base at all. And uh, that's why Arkansas lost yesterday. Or he might tell you, oh, it's, it's actually that Matt Hobbs, that pitching staff, man. They're just, they're just falling apart. Uh, which by the way, the pitching staff, if you look at the numbers, just had it, had an ERA over six for like the last 20 games of the season. They might tell you, Hey, that's, that's why. It's because the pitching fell apart. And, uh, you know, it, we were, it was fool's goal all along. This team didn't have good pitching. Uh, some people might tell you, hey, it's that Dave Van Horn. He just doesn't have that dog in him anymore, man. He just wants to be with the grandkids. He, uh, he's not serious about winning. That's what it is. Uh, that's the stupidest of the explanations. And uh, I also want to just go ahead and make it clear right now. I want you to listen very closely to what I say. If you feel like somehow Dave Van Horn has not been do doing his job well, uh, I feel like you have a little bit of a misunderstanding of just how the world works, like what's going on here. Is DVH above criticism? Hell no, he's not. He wouldn't even tell you that. Uh, but if you think that like somehow uh, them losing yesterday was was like DVH just didn't doesn't have it in them or DVH can't win at a high level, uh, I feel like that couldn't be further from the truth. And we'll get into a little bit of the ins and outs and the intricacies of all this. But uh, like I said, is I just feel like people are always looking for that reason. And they want it to point, they want it to be one thing because it would be a lot simpler if, oh, you know, we uh, we had a quarterback last year that sucks. Now we get rid of them and we have a good quarterback. Now we're going to be good. Like I wish life we all wish life were that simple or, hey, we had a bad coach. We fire him. Now we have a good one. Problem solved. Right. Uh but as we know, I mean, anyone who's followed these sports long enough kind of knows that it's never one one thing. Uh, I mean, if you watch yesterday's game, I mean, if you wanted to point to one thing yesterday, the one thing would probably be these guys in their own brains. Because uh, I think it was pretty obvious early on in about third, fourth inning that uh, that team was pressing like crazy. I think they could t certainly feel the pressure and knew what, what was at stake and knew kind of how bad it would look if they lost. And they were all trying like hell to make it happen. And, uh, you know, you just want to see your team rise to the occasion. You want to see your team in those moments when they're, you know, when it's all on the line, when the adversity is at its highest, you want to see them rise to that occasion. And uh, this current Arkansas team, they just did not do that. And uh, it sucks that they didn't do that. Like, I don't, I don't, like, I don't, I don't know what else to tell you. It sucks that they didn't do that. Um, and, of course, we're not going to diminish, you know, what they did in this regular season. They had a good regular season. And uh, in hindsight, now I guess you can probably say this team overachieved in the regular season which, uh, you know, we always use the terms overachieving, underachieving, all that. Uh, offensively, clearly Arkansas did not play to its capabilities this year. Um, and, you know, pitching staff down the stretch certainly didn't play to their capabilities. Uh, and so, you know, Dave Van Horn himself, we we're going to talk a lot about his comments and kind of what he had to say after the game. But I thought the most, uh, the most like, hauntingly true thing he said was outside of Hagen Smith, we're just, we're just pretty average. We're just an average baseball team. And, you know, the numbers kind of back that up, obviously. I mean, the offensively average is probably optimistic to describe what this team has been doing here uh, and what they did this season. Uh, but pitching staff wise, even that a little bit, I mean, especially down the stretch, especially when you take into account what they did down the stretch. Uh, if you remove Hagen Smith from that pitching staff, it's uh, it, it looked a little bit rough and they're, you know, 
DBH said the arms wore down a little bit. They were tired. And he even said, man, we, Hagen, we were, we were taking them out of the game early uh, during the season, hoping we would get that extra effort down the stretch and it didn't happen. Uh, and you know, that, that is what it is. But again, like, are we going to blame Dave Van Horn for, for pitching Hagen Smith against Kansas state? No, it just is. It's a move that didn't work out. And, uh, it's one that, you know, that just an inning inning blew up on him. Uh, but big picture, I just feel like Dave's right. This team outside of Hagen Smith was pretty average and they played well above average throughout the year. I mean, they went 33 and three at home. Uh, all these factors that I just detailed for you were there throughout the entire season anyway, like the pressure and the, just what this team needed to do and the pitching staff and all that. Uh, they still found ways to kind of rise to the occasion and pull through during the regular season. And they didn't find a way to do it here in the postseason. Uh, but if you ask DBH, uh, he basically did the Jimmy's and Joe's over X's and Joe's uh, uh, over the uh, X's and O's bit where he was just like, Hey, we just need to really look at the level of athlete that we get in here. And uh, frankly, there's been, you know, when Arkansas would play other really good players, uh, Braden Montgomery is one that comes to mind. And that's obviously a guy that Arkansas kind of threw their, their hat in the ring uh, or their, their name in the hat for that one. Uh, I think DVH was kind of very intentional when he said some of the things that he said, like Braden Montgomery. He was like, man, we were in on that guy. Sure would be nice to have an outfielder who can bring that type of, uh, that type of pop. He referenced last year's outfield and how he's like, man, we had three dudes right there. And he kind of had a smirk on his face when he's talking about, it. he's like, man, Wagner uh, or Wagner, uh, Josenberger and Jace Borfin, like all three of those guys can defend, can hit the ball for power, can hit for average or athletic. Like, those are the kind of guys, like when you think of like what kind of dudes should be playing at Arkansas, Jay Sporfin is who you think of. Tavian Josenberger is who you think of. Jared Wagner is who you think of. Three players that are all kind of different, you know, one right, one left, one switch, uh, have some different skill sets here or there. Obviously, Tavian Josenberger is a little bit more of an athlete, you know, faster than those other, those other two guys who each have their speed. Uh, Jason... Jared Wagner uh, obviously had that power, a little bit more of that power. But it's like all three of those dudes are a legitimate, like those are Arkansas Razorbacks. Those are the dudes you need year in and year out. Uh, and obviously you can't have nine of those every year. I get it. You're not going to always be able to do that. Uh, but I just think about when I talk about this Arkansas offense and sort of what's happened here the last two, three, four years, there's been a downward decline in terms of the level of talent that Arkansas has. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of times that people say, Oh, well, every, uh, every hitter under Nate Thompson gets worse. People say stuff like that, and they're dead serious when they say it, and they like, feel like they're uh, telling the truth. And uh, it doesn't help when you have people going on the internet and just outright making up stats <laughs> about Arkansas's postseason. Uh, you know who the hell you are, man. Uh, like, y you know, you all know who I'm talking about. People that just straight up just post a stat, and then 50,000 people believe that stat. Uh, doesn't help when you have people pushing that kind of rhetoric, but people say, everyone declines under uh, Nate Thompson. And look, there are like several, multiple per year examples of people who decline under Nate Thompson. And I say under Nate Thompson, like kind of doing the thing that y'all do where I just make it a blanket thing, uh, who their stats got worse at Arkansas or they weren't able to really take their games to the next level or whatever the case may be. Uh, but I did want to just kind of talk about this for a second. If you look back the last three, four years, not everyone has a, uh, has dipped statistically, uh, like Caden Wallace, for example, got substantially better from freshman to sophomore year. He was a freshman All-American, took it to another level, hit over 300 as a sophomore, had like 15, 16 home runs, ton of doubles, like really took his game to a new level. Uh, Jalen Battles is another guy who came to Arkansas as a like, you know, notable Juco guy, uh, was really good defensively as a sophomore. I guess he was a draft eligible sophomore that year. Was he a junior? I think he might've been a, draft eligible sophomore uh, but anyways he was really good defensively hit like five or six home runs hit like 250 260 like a pretty competent hitter here and there uh his junior year really took his game to the next level hit double digit home runs hit like 285 286 like sim somewhere in that range defensively was even better like he's an example of a guy who got better across the board you know at arkansas uh michael turner who statistically like his numbers might not blow you away i mean he hit 320 with nine home runs uh, had drove in like 45, 50 RBI. Uh, and those numbers weren't terribly dissimilar from what he had done the year before at Kent State. But obviously coming to a new level and coming to Arkansas and facing big-time competition, Michael Turner improved statistically in, an, in a better conference. Uh, clearly was a guy who got massively better at Arkansas. 
uh, Tavian Josenberger, I just mentioned, Jared Wagner, I just mentioned, Jace Borfin, I just mentioned. All three of those guys are examples of people who came to Arkansas and kind of took their game to that extra level. Uh, and Peyton Stovall, I feel like, is the most recent example of someone who year to year got better at Arkansas, although he got banged up as a sophomore. Uh, was obviously like this year was kind of what we had hoped to see out of Peyton Stovall. He's a guy who got better throughout his career statistically. Uh, now, what do all those guys that I just listed, which was like eight, nine guys, what all do they have in common? They are still playing baseball. They are continuing to play. Like Caden Wallace is going to play in the big leagues here in the next year or so. Uh, Jalen Battles is still is in double A right now. Uh, I would imagine at some point is going to have a cup of coffee in the MLB. Uh, Michael Turner is another guy in double A, might have a chance to play at the big leagues. Robert Moore, uh, who's a guy I didn't mention because he had a dip off from sophomore to junior year, but he was a guy who came in as like a defense first fielding second baseman uh, who hit 16 home runs as a sophomore, which hit 284. Uh, and then obviously those numbers came back down to earth a little bit. Uh, but I feel like he's an example of a guy who took a massive step forward and then followed by a massive step back. So you can do with that what you want. He's a little bit of a mixed case there, but he's another guy who's got a chance to play for a little bit longer. Josenberger, Wagner, Wagner, Borfin, Stovall, all four of those guys are going to have a chance to uh, play baseball for a really long time. So what all do they have in common? They're really talented. They qualify as what I was saying earlier as like when you think of dudes that pl that should play baseball at Arkansas, those are who you think of. Like those are the names that it's are those are the, that's kind of they look like Arkansas guys. They uh, they play like Arkansas guys and they've been getting better and they're they're you know, they took their games to new levels here at Arkansas. Um, I also think like that is kind of like the standard for like what this program has set forward of like when you have a lineup at Arkansas, these are the guys you should expect to see is those type of guys. Um, and a lot of the guys that you would point to, like people are probably in the you know, in the comments before I could even finish this rant are like, yeah, well, Brady Slavens, he got way worse by his senior year. And, uh, you know, Kendall Diggs got way worse, uh, you know, going into his junior year, even though he's a little bit banged up. Uh, you know, the list can go on and on of people. I mean, Ty Wilmsmeyer, whoever uh, you want to throw out there. A lot of what those guys have in common is not playing baseball anymore. Uh, most of those guys that you're going to reference that are like, oh, yeah, they they got worse or like they weren't able to really like take their games to the next level. Uh, probably were not really notable prospects that are no longer playing baseball. Um, now, you could say Nate Thompson ruined their career and that's what it is. Uh, I don't think you even really believe that. I think... Uh, Usually in baseball, usually in sports, the cream rises to the top. And so uh, I think Dave's point yesterday when he says, hey, we just got to get a little bit better caliber athlete in here. I think that's kind of what he's referring to is, hey, the talent and the recruiting has dipped off. And when I say the recruiting has dipped off, Arkansas had the number one class in the country last year. So you're like, how could the recruiting have dipped off? Uh, but I think when it comes to evaluating talent and bu building your roster each year, you need some of those freshmen that are going to contribute. You need some of those portal guys, division one portal guys. You need some of those guys who have been in your program for a few years and you might even need a Juco guy or two. And over the past really 20 years, Arkansas has won at a high level with every single type of guy uh, that you can imagine, you know, of those categories that I just, uh, just listed there. But uh, like, let's just take it back to uh, let's just take it back to the 2022 season. And let's just talk about this lineup for a little bit. So you have, Chris Lanzilli and Michael Turner, both Division I transfers who played well at Arkansas and kind of were exactly what they were supposed to be coming out of the portal. Uh, Cade Wallace and Peyton Stovall, two guys that you brought in as freshmen and developed, Caden Wallace being a sophomore, Peyton Stovall being a freshman. Uh, Jalen Battles and Braden Webb and Brady Slavens, JUCO guys that you brought in and developed. Uh, and then you have Robert Moore, who's another guy that you, a big-time recruit that you recruited reclassified even and kind of brought him up. I think that's kind of the vision of what you have to do. You have to pull talent from all these different directions, whether it's Juco freshman portal. Um, and that's just kind of roster and team building one on one. Like that's just what it is. And uh, I think that if we're trying to put a bow on this season and kind of determine, you know, what happened, I think Arkansas really failed to replace their outfield that they had from last year, which to be fair, we're going to have a tough time replacing it e anyway. I mean, if you go back to all the way back in the preseason when I was doing these podcasts, setting the expectations for the Arkansas lineup, I was like, man, they're going to be worse in the outfield just because they have no choice. The question is, how much worse will they be? Uh, and I think we all kind of expected Ty Wilmsmar would be better. Not not 
Definitely didn't think he was going to be Tavian Josenberger. We thought he would be closer than he was to being a legitimate, competent piece there. Uh, we certainly thought Kendall Diggs was going to be, be a lot better in right field. And we thought left field, we had a chance for all these different guys. Jason Jones, Ross Lovich, Peyton Holt, uh, Will Edmondson, whoever. Again, like that's Peyton Holt, Ross Lovich, Will Edmondson, all that, Jason Jones. Those those guys right there make up the crop of what I'm talking about. You got a JUCO guy in there. You got a Division One transfer in there. You got a freshman that you brought in in there. You got Peyton Holt, who's a JUCO guy that's been around for a while. Um, and Peyton Holt finished the year playing really well and was kind of the answer in left field. But all those other guys, they just failed to really get anything out of. Um, in the last two years, you think about Arkansas's freshman class. Uh, two years ago, you bring in Jason Jones and Mason Neville, who were very highly regarded guys at their positions. Uh, and we're kind of on that draft radar there. Uh, and then this past year, you have a you had the number one class in the country, which had a lot of arms and uh, some prospects that ended up signing, which we'll touch on here in a minute here because DVH brought that up uh, in his press conference. But you're you're kind of two headliners there, Ryder Helfrick and Nolan Souza. Uh, between Neville, Jones, Souza, and Helfrick, Arkansas somehow managed to get zero confirmed everyday players out of that group. That is that is an extremely damning, like what the hell happened type of thing. You know, I think that's that's a big deal. I mean, preseason, I think part of what gave this team confidence in going in is thinking, hey, we're going to get something from some of these freshmen. Uh, and Ryder Helfrick in the offseason uh, looked like he was the best, one of the best players on the team. Like you saw the talent there, uh, and it just failed to material materialize in the season for whatever reason. Uh, you bring in a transfer in Vahiva Aloy, who had a good year. I mean, everyone notices that his batting average is 100 points lower uh, than it was at Sacramento State, um, though his power numbers were pretty much the same. I'm not, I don't put as much stock into that because I think that his batting average was going to be lower than 376, no matter where he was at this, this, uh, this season, just because people kind of know who he is and they know to pitch around him a little bit. Uh, but also coming to the SEC, if y'all want me to be upset about a guy as a sophomore playing shortstop every day, hitting 270 with 14 home runs. If you want me to be upset about it, I'm just not going to be. I know that you are. I know I know that some people are. I personally am not going to be. Uh, in fact, I, I think Arkansas needs more guys like Nolan, or not, like Fahiva Aloy. Um, you know, and look, I'm not going to go through the whole roster right here and kind of just evaluate what we expected from each guy and what they produced, but I think when DBH watched his team get eliminated yesterday, he probably thought, man, I just wish we had a little bit, you know, more guys that teams feared, frankly. I think that's something that we talked about a lot this season. Uh, and I mean, you go back to the, you know, years past in Arkansas baseball with guys like Dominic Fletcher, guys like Heston Kerstad, Chad Spanberg, even before them, like it seemed like Arkansas every year was pretty good about having one, two, three of those caliber of guys. Um, and Arkansas had a lot of pretty good players on this team. I just want to say that Arkansas had a lot of pretty good players on this team. Um, but that's that's what Arkansas had. They had a lot of pretty good players. Um, which, by the way, I, even a week ago, thought would be enough because I thought offensively this team didn't really need all, you know, need these guys to rise to such a high level here. But uh, that's kind of that's kind of what the situation was. Um <laughs> But also, I do also want to clarify. So when people talk, when we're, we're, we're trying, I'm trying to be as rational and level-headed as I can throughout this whole thing because, again, like I said, you see your team lose and everyone just wants to point to one thing and be like, what the hell happened here? Um, and they, they kind of, it's, it's very black and white to a lot of people. Oh, the hitting sucks? Let's fire the hitting coach. Oh, the pitching sucks? Oh, let's fire the pitching coach. Uh, oh, our team failed to meet expectations this year? Let's fire the head coach. Uh, which, you know, there's times and places to do all those things. And, you know, we'll see how it plays out this offseason. But uh, I thought it was interesting that when Dave Van Horn was asked basically about Nate Thompson, which shout out to Andrew Hutchinson, who worded the question pretty carefully in terms of like, would you consider a philosophical change or whatever and all that? Uh, and DVH kind of laid out his stance for you guys. And frankly, it's a stance I don't disagree with uh, where he says, oh, we don't have like an approach problem though, though, of course, those are things that you always need to be coaching on. And, you know, second and third one out, let's shorten up and let's, let's hit a fly ball to the outfield. Let's go, let's do our six, four, as we called it when I was in high school, where you, you're trying to hit a ball up the middle through the four and six holes there. Um, I just want people to understand, like, cause again, 
I'm not saying that you can't criticize Dave Van Horn. I'm not saying you can't criticize Nate Thompson or Matt Hobbs or whoever the hell. Uh, I'm trying to make the point that it's kind of a group cumulative, like nobody is a, away from blame, but not one person needs to wear it all because a lot of times what I, you know, and following this sport and following this fan base a little bit, like, for example, against a and uh, I keep going back to this example just because it's one that is in my brain. Peyton Stovall comes up with runners on first and third, one out against a left-handed pitcher, and he strikes out. And immediately, the internet is flooded with, man, this team and their approach, it just sucks. And I just really like, I really want us to sit down and think about this for a second. Do you re- do y'all really in y'all's hearts believe that Nate Thompson is going to his hitters and saying, hey guys, if you get up in a 0-0 game with runners on first and third with one out, I want you to just launch that bad boy. We're not we're not worried about getting that run in at third. We're just we're just going to launch away and we're going to swing and miss at a breaking ball on the plate. Like do you think that's that's like what the game plan was? Now, if obviously that's what happened. Peyton Stovall swung and missed at a slider in the dirt and he struck out. Like cool. Uh do y'all think it's because Peyton is sitting there thinking like, well, my hitting coach wants me to hit a home. like do y'all really think that's like how these things work? No. He uh he guessed wrong. He thought he was getting a fastball and he swung and it was, it was like that's just what happened. Uh and it's like I think a lot of times people see things and try to extrapolate it and be like, oh, this must mean X and Y and Z. Uh, or they do the thing where they're like, oh, Peyton Stovall sucks, uh, which again, not true. Um, like sometimes things happen. And <laughs> this weekend, really bad things happened. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. And so we're gonna continue, like I said on this show to talk about all of those reasons, all of the shortcomings for this Arkansas baseball program, because there are very clear and obvious ones that we can talk about, but it's really hard to have this conversation with people because they just kind of immediately go to fire DVH, fire Nate Thompson, like the, you know, well, it's a bad approach. That's what it is. Um, I, I just, I don't know. Was it a bad approach in 2021 when they led the nation in scoring? no, but they had a lot of better dudes. They were, they had a team equipped to play that kind of style. And it obviously worked out really well for them. Was it a bad approach in 2022 when Peyton Stovall uh, hit 400 for the NCAA tournament and was crushing and was on top of the world? Like, no, it wasn't a bad approach. They just had a better team dudes more equipped to play that way. Uh, and when I think about this year's team and make no mistake about this, everyone always says like, Oh, it's the same results every year. It's just not true. Especially when you're talking about the offense where this season's offense was by far, and I mean by far, the worst Arkansas has had under Nate Thompson. Uh, like, without a doubt. I am not, like, anybody who is telling you different is lying to you. Last year, even with a bunch of dudes banged up, they were better across the board, hit for way more power, got on base way more often. Uh, it was just a it was just a thing, and that was one of the worst offenses they had had. Uh, even in 2022, where they underachieved, better across the board statistically, scored way more runs, were one of the, one of the better scoring teams in the SEC. Uh, and then in 2021, like I said, led the nation in scoring, led the nation in home runs. Uh, and then 2020, 2019, 2018, before that, those were great years offensively for Arkansas. So it's like, there's two things here. One, everyone always says like, oh, this it was bad this year, and that's how it's always been. Not true. What y'all are missing is that there is a very obvious downward decline. Like that should be, if you're going to, if you're going to craft the anti Nate Thompson thing, you should say, Hey, uh, it's, you know, once he, once he ran out of, you know, the, the players that were kind of already there and the standard that had already be set. I mean, especially with those 2018, 19 teams that pretty much were not players that he recruited. Uh, once he ran out of that, it's been, it's been downwardly declining. That's an absolute fact. That's what's been happening. And we can talk about that and why it's happening. Uh, and I think DVH gave you a little bit of a clue yesterday where, I think he truly feels this is a talent evaluation and a talent production standpoint where you've got to get bigger and better and faster dudes. Uh, DVH also did talk about, for, for, cause I also saw a p- few people saying DVH refuses to play small ball, which anyone who says re- DVH is refusing to play small ball just became an Arkansas baseball fan like the other day. Uh, cause when I was a kid growing up, like in 09, 2012, uh, the 2014 team didn't make a run to Omaha. But those were teams that, like, literally, if they got a leadoff walk, were bunting that guy over. Uh, and if they had runners on first and second with no outs, they were going crazy trying to bunt those guys over. Like, they were consistently, like, inning to inning playing small ball. Why? Those teams were equipped to do that. That's how they had to win. That's how they had to play. 
uh, historically, or at least I should say, this last six, seven years as the program has kind of risen a little bit, Arkansas has not needed to rely on small ball to score runs. This year, they probably could have and probably should have, uh, but years past, like if that 2021 team would have tried to play small ball, it would have been a much less effective offense because that team needed to hit nukes. Uh, it's just how it is. Um, and now I know a lot of people are going to say like, well, you know, I'm just sick of the like home run or bust approach, uh, which like I get, but also it, even then it's not like Nate Thompson is not coaching these guys saying guys only try and hit home runs. And if you really truly in your heart think that that's what's happening, then you just, I'm just telling you, it is a misunderstanding of just how the world works, how baseball works, how coaching works and just what's going on at this level. Like we are talking about a very high level of baseball. I can assure you with 1 billion percent certainty, Nate Thompson is not coaching home run or bust. I'll just tell you that right now. Like, and I know that it's like, you know, a simplistic like way that we view this thing through and that's just kind of how it's got to be. Uh, but it, it's just not that way. What Nate Thompson kind of the, the mentality and DVH kind of touched on this a little bit that he really coaches swings uh, the, the basically in Matt Goodhart has had some like tweet storms about this, uh, you know, where it's like, it's all about hitting the ball as hard as you possibly can. Like we're, we're trying to hit the ball hard. It does not matter where that is. If it's to left field, if it's to right field, if it's up the middle, if it's whatever. Uh, so people always say launch angle. Um, and that's, it's just not a thing that Arkansas is trying to do, trying to, uh, to launch the ball. It's just, they're trying to hit the ball hard. You can argue whether, you know, we can, we can talk hitting and swing mechanics and all that. If you want, that's a really boring podcast that I have zero interest in being a part of. Uh, but I just get really annoyed when I see people, you know, talking about issues on the team and they just say such blanket overhaul stuff where they're like, Oh, well, uh, you know, we, we, Nate Thompson just wants to hit home runs, home run or bus. Like, that's just what it is. Like, it's just, it's just not what any hitting coach around the country is doing. It's there's just a little bit more nuance to these things. Um, and so I, you know, again, I'm, I'm getting a little off track here, but I just wanted to kind of touch on some of the like annoying things that uh, we all kind of see on a daily basis here real quick. Um, but I mentioned the draft earlier because I think that's an important part of this process. And I think also that's going to be an important part of what Arkansas does this offense or this off season is kind of figuring out how the draft plays out, figuring out what other teams lose pieces of the draft, what Arkansas is going to lose to the draft. Uh, we'll see if they're able to keep, the majority of their high school recruiting class. And look, we're going to, we're going to, this is not the last uh, podcast I'm going to be doing this week. I'm probably going to do three actually, because I'm going to do, I'm going to have Daniel Sheehan tomorrow. We're going to do a live stream taking questions and he's going to do his victory lap for uh, Kansas state, but we will continue to talk about the answers of who Arkansas should expect to keep, who they should expect to leave and kind of how the draft is going to shake out. And we'll talk about the recruiting class a little bit more in depth. Uh, but I will just say as a general, you know, mark for the off off season, this is not like last offseason where Arkansas had to really pay attention in the first two rounds of the draft of like, are all of our high school guys going to get signed? Uh, Arkansas has a few guys that are kind of be in that mix that we can keep an eye on, but it's not going to be a thing where Arkansas is going to get just, uh, you know, abused by the draft. Uh, I'm thinking maybe maximum two to three high school kids sign. Maximum. Uh, now, we'll, you know, we'll see how it plays out, and as the draft gets closer, we'll have a little bit more firmer of an idea, but as it stands right now, it seems like it's going to be a lot less of a uh, big deal in terms of who Arkansas is going to lose to the draft from their high school recruiting class. Um, but Dave man mentioned that last year that uh, he was like, yeah, we had a lot of position players, you know, signed that ended up, you know, going and playing pro ball. And he basically said that they weren't, you know, they were hoping some of those guys, they could get one or two of those guys. Um, and look, I get that. I mean, a guy like Nizan uh, Zanatello, I believe is that, is that the kid's name? Uh, like he was kind of on that fringe there. Uh, but like Kendall George, from what I could tell, was never really coming to Arkansas. Who knows what, you know, these coaches were hearing behind the, behind closed doors. It just didn't seem like he was there. Like that wasn't a surprise to me. Uh, Walker Martin played a little bit of a, he, he was kind of doing the PR move the whole time. But I mean, he signed for 2.6 million. Uh, like I don't, I don't think he was necessarily coming to Arkansas or, or really had his sights set. And I, frankly, I talked to Aiden Miller, you know, off the record multiple times and I could really barely even get him to pretend like he was going to Arkansas. Uh, so it's like, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I buy necessarily that, Oh, that's why our roster didn't have a ton of talent this year is because we were stunned by what happened in the draft. Cause I feel like most of those guys, it was kind of a uh, kind of interesting, you know, kind of like already knew what was going on, but 
that kind of makes me wonder, like, what DVH was hearing behind closed doors from these kids. I mean, obviously, he's talking to them uh, very directly and sort of what they were trying to make happen with their roster construction last year. It seems like they uh, they were they had bigger plans and those plans just didn't really uh, come through. And, you know, it kind of reminds me a little bit on a much lesser extent to uh, Arkansas basketball this past season where now, you know, when I say Arkansas basketball, that's a lot of things going there. But uh, Musselman all year kind of hated his team. And I think part of that was he really wanted Grant Nelson. Thought they were going to get Grant Nelson. Didn't get him. Really wanted Ron Holland. Thought they were going to get Ron Holland. Get, didn't get him. And uh, I think it was probably like, in hindsight, you know, they they they, they brought in a few other guys. Like, uh, I forget the kid, Denajah Harris. Uh, like, they bring in him. They bring in Chandler Lawson. But I think that was a very obvious moment where Muss and his staff kind of went in with the plan and had to adapt. And then it turned out their roster wasn't good enough. Uh, and I think DVH, his roster was a lot more talented by comparison to Musselman's. Uh, but I think that's kind of what happened here is DVH kind of had plans for a better roster and it didn't really work out. And uh, I think now in hindsight, he probably thinks we didn't, uh, we didn't attack some of these, these holes the way that we probably should have. And I do want to also just be clear, like, just because Arkansas didn't get Braid Montgomery doesn't mean they didn't try to get Braid Montgomery. And, uh, you know, just because they didn't end up signing so-and-so or they they had a bad outfield this year doesn't mean like they weren't trying to do it. I understand it's not as simple as just picking who you want and bringing them in. Uh, but I think in hindsight, I think this coaching staff probably thinks, ah, we weren't as good off from a roster talent standpoint than we thought. Uh, and maybe they thought some of these freshmen were going to uh, contribute a little bit more than they did. Um, and I do want to, uh, I do want to touch on Arkansas's current roster and who might be coming back. I'm literally, I was thinking about how to do this. I have the roster pulled up. We're just going to go player by player. Who might be back? Who should be back? Who wasn't? It's not going to take that long. Just five minutes. I was like, I, I could do this in a really creative way, or we can just go on down the line and do it. So I'm just going to do it like that. But before I do that, I did also want to touch on something that we touched on yesterday. Uh, on our post game reaction show, which by the way, if you missed those, it sucks that uh, the postseason only lasted three games, so we didn't have a chance to really ramp it up and like have a long run of the bombastic post game show. But they were a lot of fun, and uh, you know, I know a lot of people tune into those. So if you missed any of those and you want to, you know, get some entertainment, uh, throw on our one after the Kansas State game where I was really making the case for Arkansas winning three games in two days here. Uh, so if you want to make fun of me, that's a good one to do. But also yesterday, Curtis and I, as we were trying to process the loss that Arkansas had in the season ending. We talked a little bit about some of this, but frankly, just the rough look it is for, for Arkansas and really just for, for Dave in particular, that he gave the speech that he did on Saturday night of, we can do it, uh, everyone wants to be negative, like this team can do it, and I wouldn't want to play us right now, and nobody wants to play us. And so obviously after Arkansas lost, everyone was was dunking on DVH, and how could he say that, and blah, blah, blah. Um, I just, like, let's just... Let's cut the bullshit real quick and let's just talk about this. Guys, of course, DVH said what he said on Saturday night. The season was still going on. And not only was it still going on, the season was like in dire straits where like Arkansas kind of needed. And when I say Arkansas, I mean the team needed that push. And so DVH is trying to fire up his guys. Nobody wants to play us right now. I'm sure he was even talking himself into it a little bit. Um, if we are going to actually like genuinely begrudge him for saying it, like, what are we doing here? Uh, now, of course, he said it. It didn't work out that way. He's got to live with that, and everyone on the internet is going to let him know about that. And, like, that's all fine and dandy. I have no issue with that. Uh, but in terms of, like, I've, I've had some people, like, genuinely really inquire as, like, why would he say that? Like, no shit. The season's still going on. Like, of course, he's got to try and motivate his guys and fire them up. And, you know, I mean, that just, you know, he's, he's doing what he thinks is best as a head coach. And obviously, it, it flipped on him. It, it blew up in his face. And uh, it is what it is. Um, so it is a tough look, but I'm like, are people really, like, upset about it? Like, and look, we kind of made fun of him on the show yesterday for it. He'll probably have a laugh about it in a, in a few months. It is what it is. It's just one of those things. But uh, I did just want to kind of touch on that because I know that I, like, I can't remember who it was that really reached out and was like, was like, why would he do that? And I'm just like, eh. I, I was into it when he did it. I'm sure a lot of y'all were into it when he did it. It didn't work out. What are you going to do? But uh, in terms of Arkansas's roster, I have it pulled up here now. So we are going to we're going to start the very bottom is what we're going to do. We're going to start at the very bottom. Now nah, we'll start at the top because the top is a little bit a little bit uh, more interesting to talk about. 
Uh, Ty Wilmsmeyer, gone. Graduated, out of eligibility. Thank you for your services. I uh, apologize for making fun of you on the podcast, Ty. Um, you had a good little, you had a good showing here in the postseason, and we appreciate that. Thank you for your services. Go get you some Lamberts in Springfield, kid. We appreciate it. Uh, Nolan Souza, who just finished up his freshman year, got to keep this dude on the roster. Uh, he, he had one at-bat yesterday, struck out, did not have a great finish to the season. I believe he finished three for 37, uh, really kind of struggled uh, down the stretch there, which we've seen happen to a lot of freshmen. Uh, you know, it happens, and, you know, you don't feel great about it. I think this summer I'll be interested to see if he ends up going to the Cape or Northwoods or wherever. Uh, I will be tapped in with Nolan Souza's summer ball updates because I think it's going to be very important for him to go out, get some reps, see legitimate pitching, and just, you know, as a hitter, that's the only way you get better is to play. See pitching, see pitches, hit pitches, continue to do that. Also find a position defensively. We'll see if he ends up playing second, third, first. Maybe they try him in the outfield. Uh, if Arkansas had taken the lead in the ninth inning yesterday, we would have likely seen Nolan Souza in the outfield unless they did a double switch there, which I guess they could have done. Uh, but again, Nolan Souza is a guy. I am still very bullish on him as a prospect. I think he's got a bright future. I think he's a super talented kid. One of those guys who fits the criteria of a super talented kid that you expect to have a positive development track here at Arkansas. Uh, I expect in five years I will be you know, sh rattling off his statistics as a guy who took a massive step forward. And I mean, we saw this, this off season or this, this season kind of the potential that's there. I mean, you kind of see it. And uh, I think Nolan Sousa is a very important piece. I really hope Arkansas is able to retain him. Uh, Jack Wagner out of eligibility. Again, thank you for your services. Uh, I really enjoyed covering Jack Wagner. Enjoyed being around him. He's a great guy. And uh, yeah, I really feel like it sucks that he got a little bit of a raw deal in his one year at Arkansas. Didn't get to go to the, didn't get to go to Omaha. Didn't really get to uh, play the role that I'm sure he thought he was going to get to play. And, uh, you know, it's a tough one. Uh, but he will not be back next season. Uh, Kendall Diggs is a junior with eligibility remaining. Uh, now, I think a lot of people have kind of written him off as a guy. I mean, he's draft eligible, obviously. I'll be very interested to see. I can't imagine. I, it, as it stands today, as of June 3rd, I haven't talked to people i haven't talked to scouts i haven't talked to like decision makers or anything like that i just have a hard time believing that uh that he's going to going to be drafted in the first 10 to 12 rounds which is typically when like if you're a junior looking to sign that's usually about when you like pat once it gets past that 12th round is usually about when it's like okay probably like at this point you're not signing for as much uh, you'd probably make more money just coming back to school um, so I am a uh, let me just mark me in the category of skeptical that Kendall Diggs is not going to be co playing college baseball next season. Uh, I think that's obviously a piece that you would want to get back, a piece that we've seen be productive at a, at a high level before. Uh, would like, well, you know, we'll we'll see if he returns next year and what that looks like. Um, Ben McLaughlin, I do not believe has any eligibility remaining. Uh, he is a senior and he is not redshirted and he's not a COVID guy. I think he just played his four years. Um, I'll have to check on that, though. I'm, I'm pretty sure he doesn't have eligibility remaining, uh, matter of fact. Um, now, I'll just move on while I'm looking this up, though. Hudson White is a junior. Now, he is one that I am not expecting to uh, to return at Arkansas. I'm just, I just don't see. Uh, I think he's he's he, he finished on a tear down the stretch there, uh, and he was kind of a guy that was re re revered as a, a draft prospect coming into the year. I thought he had a pretty solid junior season. Definitely finished the year strong. I imagine he will uh, he will get drafted and move on after the season. And uh, my research has let me know that it is Ben McLaughlin played four years, did not redshirt. He played them all, used his eligibility. Like, I think we're good there. Uh, he's not a COVID guy either, so it's not like he gets a COVID year. Um, so, hey, Ben McLaughlin, really genuinely, genuinely enjoyed Ben McLaughlin. I think he's a guy that you want to talk about guys who underachieved, overachieved. Arkansas got as much as they as they as as Ben McLaughlin could give them. And uh, that was a lot. I mean, he was a middle of the lineup for the last two years. Really solid piece. And, uh, you know, I wish you well, Ben McLaughlin. Come on the, ben, uh, the Bombastic Podcast next time you're in town. Uh, Vahiva Loy, he's going to be back. Very important piece. Potential first, second round pick. Like, he's going to be one of your headliners. He'll likely be a preseason All-American, preseason All-SEC. Uh, maybe the most talented guy on the team. Like, that is a big, notable piece. That Arkansas is gonna get, gonna get is gonna get back and kind of needs to be a dude. 
Uh, him and Nolan Souza really looking forward to their future. Peyton Stovall, we expect him to be drafted in the top 80, 90 picks. Uh, we wish you well on your journey, sir. Uh, and we'll, you know, I don't need to, I don't need to commemorate the careers of all these guys. We'll move on a little bit. Uh, Jay Bucho did not pitch this year, was not on the travel roster. I should ask our interns since they recorded a podcast with him, uh, if they get a good feel of kind of what he's going to do. I'd love to see Jay Wu, Jay Wu return, uh, maybe go out in summer ball, get some solid reps there. Uh, you know, he's, he's interesting. He's interesting. And we'll, we'll see how that one plays out. Uh, Jared Spraglot out of eligibility. Uh, thank you for your services, sir. Really appreciate it. Jason Jones is a sophomore. Now this is another interesting one where, you know, didn't play this year was not an everyday guy. Uh, the last two years, historically speaking, it's pretty rare to keep these guys around, especially highly talented recruits when they're not playing every day. So we'll see how his exit meeting goes. We'll see like what he's thinking mentally. I have not talked to uh, to him in a few weeks. I've not talked to his parents or anything. Like I have no idea. I'm not gonna spe- I'm not gonna start my speculation on that front uh, anytime soon. But we'll we'll just see how it plays out. But obviously has eligibility remaining. Could come back. But we'll see. I'd imagine he's gonna explore a few different options. Uh, Ross Lovich, senior. Thank you for your services. Hudson Polk, senior. Thank you for your services. Uh, Hunter Grimes, redshirt senior, did not play this year. Thank you for your services. Uh, Reese Robinette's another one where uh, he was a true sophomore this year, though he redshirted, so I guess he would be a redshirt sophomore next year. Local kid, so maybe you're thinking, and he wasn't a super highly regarded prospect. You'd think he has a good chance to stick around. He's going to be a fascinating one because I think this dude can really, really help, like truly help. I think he's got potential to be one of the the better stories on the team next year if he's able to, to find a way to get in that lineup and contribute. And uh, he's got a lot of pop. He's got a big time power swing from the left side. I've seen him hit just about all kind of pitching you can hit. Don't forget about big country. Now he may end up totally transferring. I mean, um, that's very much in play. Do not sleep on big country though. I will be very intrigued to see what he does this off season. Uh, will Edmondson's a junior. I see no reason why he wouldn't return next year. Now, obviously I know that people are going to say, well, you know, um, I would imagine, I don't know. I mean, unless he wants to, you know, go somewhere where he can definitively play every day, but you know, there are worse things to have than a guy like that who, you know, scrappy, uh, not scared of the moment, you know, pretty athletic, can play pretty much any corner outfield spot. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't I don't see why you wouldn't want to bring a guy like that back, but we'll see what Arkansas's outfield depth looks like next year. I'd imagine that's going to be a place that they're going to want to go out, especially after what DVH said yesterday. They're going to want out, want to go out and get some dudes there uh, in the outfield. So we'll see how it plays out for Will Edmondson, but he's got eligibility left, so he's, a, he's an option. Gabe Gackle will be back, uh, you know, maybe the most important player on this roster now. Um, the future is bright for Gabe Gackle. We'll talk a lot about him this summer and talk about him going into the season, but just know he'll be back. Uh, Mason Molina, we expect to get drafted. Uh, DVH said as much yesterday. Thank you for your services, sir. Uh, Ty Wade, freshman who redshirted, didn't play this year. We'll see what he does. I would love to see him return because he's another guy with some some legitimate pop after redshirt in this year. Uh, and I would like to see what he does this summer, you know, TBD on his future, but he's got eligibility left could absolutely return. Uh, to my knowledge, Peyton Holt does not have eligibility left for some reason. I kind of talked myself into it and was like, Oh, he could totally, uh, he could totally play. But no, I think, uh, I think this, this, this was his COVID season because he was a true freshman in 2020. Uh, now he went to Louisiana Lafayette for a fall goes to Crowder, plays his freshman season, 17 games at Crowder, uh, then played two more seasons at Crowder. So like redshirt freshman and redshirt sophomore years at Crowder, played his redshirt junior year at Arkansas last year. Uh, to my to my knowledge, this was his fifth season of college. Uh, this was his COVID year, and so we are not expecting uh, Peyton Holt to return, but absolutely thank that guy for his services. Uh, dude's a stud, absolutely. Brady Tiger Jr., he's a little bit of... I talked about this a little bit last week's podcast. Uh, does he return? Like, what does his draft situation look like? I imagine he will have a chance to get drafted and sign, and if he wants to sign, uh, he absolutely can do that. Uh, but I'll be very interested to see, like, sort of what his... Because uh, I feel like he's going to be a little bit of a polarizing prospect where I'm sure a lot of people are very, very high on him based on the potential, based on uh, the stuff that he's shown, and just if you get that arm healthy, you feel like the that's the, like untapped potential there. Uh, but also I think the arm issues like are going to be a thing that people talk about that teams ask about. And so we'll see what happens. Uh, 
But I, I tentatively, DVH said he doesn't expect the rotation to be back next year. I think just tentatively, people should be expecting him to get drafted and signed this summer, uh, just the way it is. Uh, Tate McGuire, freshman, pitched a little bit. Could be back. Would probably be nice to get him back. He's got good stuff, mid-90s from the right side. Uh, we'll see if he goes out and plays this summer. And uh, I can't wait to get that summer ball list. It just shows all the design- destinations. Ryder Helfrich, freshman, catcher. Uh, probably didn't have the freshman year that I or a lot of people expected him to have. Big time piece, similar to Nolan Souza. Got to get that guy, keep that guy on campus. Got to keep developing him. Really looking forward to seeing what his future looks like and what his summer looks like. Uh, Cody Frank, we thank you for your services, sir. Uh, Dylan Carter is a redshirt junior who could return for another year. I will be very interested to see if he decides to do that. Now, he's been in college forever now. He's had arm issues. He's had... You know, he just come, he came off of a huge surgery. Uh, I believe he has he has the alter, he option. He has a COVID year left, and uh, I would love to see him use it. That'd be awesome. Uh, Hunter Dietz, freshman, left-hander, pitcher. You got to get that guy back, man. He he only pitched, I guess, two innings this year. One, he was your highly regard, your most highly regarded arm coming into the season out of that freshman class. If you can get him healthy, DVH even referenced him as a potential rotation piece. Uh, so expect him back, and I will look forward to see what he does this offseason. Hagen Smith, don't think he's coming back. Thank you for your services, sir. Uh, who actually, by the way, broke the NCAA record for uh, strikeouts per nine innings. So shout out to Hagen Smith. Congrats, buddy. Uh, Diego Ramos, freshman, redshirted, did not play this year. Eligibility left. We'll see how that plays out. Parker Coyle's a sneaky one, sophomore who has pitched a pretty good amount in his first two years on campus. You would imagine they would want to get that guy back and see what he could do this summer. He had a pretty productive offseason last summer. Uh, up and down a little bit as a sophomore, but he finished the year pretty strong. Weirdly enough, did not get used this past weekend uh, during the NCAA regional, but I think that just kind of they're probably hoping to save him for games two and three there uh, yesterday. But Parker Coyle, keep an eye on him this offseason. I would expect him to be back, but you never know in this day and age. Uh, but I think that's an interesting one. Jake Faraday is about to get drafted and cash a lot of checks this summer. We salute you, Jake Faraday. Uh, really appreciated watching his career. And uh, you guys should appreciate Jake Faraday a little bit more. I'll just say that. You do appreciate him. He, uh, you know, he, he, he continued to persevere. He's all hog, man. He stayed here for three years, despite not getting to pitch a ton in his first two years. Uh, he will get drafted and signed this summer, and I look forward to that. Colin Fisher, who just had his surgery, they're hoping to have him back this offseason. Uh, you know, had a pretty promising freshman year, started some midweek games. Had a huge uh, performance out of the bullpen there in Arlington. Uh, I think he's a notable piece. They're hoping to have him back by Christmas time, back from his injury. Uh, expect him back. Looking forward to that. Um, Tucker Holland has been, you know, was banged up. They redshirted him this year. Uh, pitched a little bit in the fall. We got to see a little bit before he got banged up. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna go TBD on that one because we have not heard anything from him in a while, and uh, it wasn't going particularly well for him before he got banged up in the fall. Uh, so we'll see. Um, but another freshman that has eligibility left, we'll see. Ben Bybee is kind of in that same coil category. Uh, really promising outing the other day. I thought took a noticeable step forward as a sophomore. And I think he's a guy you got to pay attention to this summer as maybe he takes that next little jump and he's a legitimate weekend dude, whether it's out of the bullpen, whether that's starting games, which we've seen him do. Uh, I'm very interested to see what Ben Bybee looks like this offseason. Will McIntyre, to my knowledge, has a COVID years of, of eligibility left. Uh, I do not believe he has made a decision on what he's going to do. I don't know what he's going to do, and I think that you know we'll just kind of let him figure it out. Uh, he has a year of eligibility if he wants to use it, but also, uh, I mean, he's 37 years old at this point. <laughs> That's a joke. Just, just a joke. We love Will McIntyre, and man, really made me sad watching uh, watching him at that press conference yesterday, knowing that uh, that might be the last time we get to watch him pitch. He's all hog, of course. He's had a lot of great moments in his career. I will never forget uh, some of the awesome moments Will McIntyre has given us. And, uh, you know, we'll see. But it'd be, it'd be awesome if he came back. I, uh, but I would imagine that seems like maybe not the most fun thing to do is stay in school for another year. I know I wouldn't want to do it. Um, so it is what it is. Uh, Parker Rowland, uh, believe, does not have any eligibility left. We thank you for your services, sir. What a stud. Uh, hit that home run yesterday. Uh, drove in the last two runs of the season. Love to see that. Uh, and then next, you got a group of three sophomores here. We're almost to the end, I swear. Gage Wood, Christian Fouch, and Cooper Dossett. Uh, all three of those guys 
took steps forward this season. I really think they're big pieces in terms of next year's roster. If they can continue their development, continue to become bona fide dudes, uh, we'll make you a little bit more excited about what you got in that pitching staff next year. I look forward to seeing what all three of those guys do this summer and this offseason. Stone Hewlett, senior, we wish you well on your journey, sir. Thank you for your uh, extremely specialized and extremely consistent left-handed services. Jack Smith, freshman, uh, left-hander, who I really like a lot. I don't know if he's going to end up, you know, transferring out or doing whatever. He wasn't on the, obviously wasn't on the the roster this season. Uh, but, you know, really, really big fan of that kid wherever he ends up. I think he's got a chance to uh, to pitch for a really long time. Uh, Josh Heineman, who missed all of this season and last season due to uh, due to Tommy John surgery, which he had. I believe he's throw- he's he's been throwing here for a couple months now. Uh, I look forward to seeing his in-state kid from Jonesboro, former football player. Uh, can't wait to see what he does this offseason. Like I've said a few times now, the last time I saw him pitch, he threw really, really well. Uh, we'll see if he how he looks post surgery, but you know a lot of times people get a little bit of an uptick in velo post surgery. So we'll see if Josh Heineman's going to be uh, on the mound this fall, touching ninety seven for Arkansas. I'd love to see it, and uh, we'd love to see him and his family get to enjoy uh, him getting out there and really helping this program because I know he's been just chomping at the bit. I'd imagine to get out there and help his uh, help his squad. Uh, Adam Hatchman, Hackman, Hatchman. I think it's Hackman. I think it's Hackman, but uh, he's the final guy on this roster. And a very important piece. He was, again, like Dietz, one of Arkansas's top-regarded freshman arms coming into this season. Uh, Was a guy that was a very serious draft risk last summer. And uh, it seems like uh, he should be back. I mean, he should be throwing this summer. I don't know. I mean, I doubt he's going to go throw in any league or anything. But he should be getting back on the mound. And he's thrown some bullpens behind closed doors. So he should be a full go in terms of health by the time they pick back up this fall. And I cannot wait to see him throw because I've not seen him throw against the collegiate hitter. And uh, we'll see how that plays out, but a super talented, super live arm and uh, sort of a little bit of an X factor for Arkansas this off season. So guys, that's the general rundown of the roster and kind of who's in, who's out, who might be back and whatever. And of course, like that, those were very vague answers I just gave you. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of moving parts here. We will continue to see sort of how this thing plays out, but I just wanted to kind of, go through that and give you the general like shape up of how it works out and kind of some of these guys that you might've been wondering about. So I can't wait to, uh, you know, again, be back with you guys tomorrow. Cause me and Daniel, she are going to do a live stream. He's going to do his, uh, his victory lap, which he, you know, he has earned. Uh, he said this Arkansas team sucked. I'm going to have to buy him some CJ's butcher boy burgers. Uh, just, just because of that. And it sucks. We got to wear it. But, uh, I look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow out on the chat. So make sure you're there tomorrow afternoon. We will be chatting, live streaming, answering all your questions, uh, which we really didn't get to do on the post game show just because there was so much going on and so much to kind of talk about and get into. But this will be a lot more interactive of a show this summer. Uh, as always, make sure you're subscribed and all that below. Appreciate you guys for tuning in. And uh, again, we will continue to paint this picture this off season and dive into every possible facet of this Arkansas baseball program this summer. And uh, I look forward to it, man. I really do think it's going to be a lot of fun, even though I wish we could have started this process a few weeks later. It is what it is. But uh, again, it's Andrew Ellis with another uh, fantastic edition of the Bombastic Podcast. I really appreciate you guys for tapping in as always. And uh, hope you have a beautiful Monday night. (laughs) 